Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. Like I said in the introduction, I'm here with Joe Dillon at Atacon Energy Solutions. Joe, welcome to the show. Ben, thanks. Super excited to be here. I yeah, I'm glad to have you on, and I'm I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. You know, we we did a little bit of talking before we hit record here, and you and your company, you guys float so nicely right in the middle of the Bitcoin mining industry and the power industry. So really, really excited to to dive into this today. Um, where I'd actually like to start is you have this immensely deep background in energy, oil and gas, electrical markets, and Bitcoin mining. And so you have this huge breadth of experience. Could you maybe walk us through some of that experience? And then what was the catalyst to getting into Bitcoin mining? Yeah, Ben, thanks and and happy to. It's been it's definitely been a little bit of a journey for the last 25 years or so. So um happy to happy to share that story a little bit. Um I started uh out of college and went to Tulane. I got a mechanical engineering degree. Um kind of this was in the kind of early two thousands. Uh job market was okay, not amazing. I moved moved over to Houston and started doing kind of environmental consulting work for industrial facilities, large land developers. Um, you know, it was, it was interesting and it was, it was fun and it was a job. Um, and then, you know, that, that company continued to grow and evolve. And, and I was kind of beginning to, as you do in your first job, look for what's next. And I, I ran into a buddy of mine uh, from college, another engineer of mine. And he's like, Hey, I'm beginning, I'm getting ready to go work over in, in Asia. Um, are you interested? And uh, my wife was like, yes, we're interested. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, we uh, looked looked at that and uh, that's kicked off a really awesome journey where I moved. Um, we moved to Singapore and over the course of the next 10 years, we were in Singapore, Australia, Brazil. Um, I started working with a company called the American Bureau of Shipping initially, which is a, like a large regulatory body for things that float. So think of it like... Um, kind of like how Standard & Poor's reviews insurance policies and kind of, you know, structures on regulatory. It's like that, but for um, deep water offshore oil rigs or boats or platforms or wind farms okay. where you're making sure the lifeboats work, all the machinery is commissioned correctly, the steel's welded right, you have all the, you know, both the safety and the operational pieces. So it's kind of a, a crash course on how all big, large capital industrial manufacturing works. And so... From there, after a couple of years, I realized I, I enjoyed working with the um, the actual service firms more than kind of being on the regulatory side because I, I I mean I hate seeing a problem and then not being able to just go fix it myself. And so yeah. I moved over with some of the um, you know names a lot of your listeners may know your Transoceans of the world, your Inscos, some of the largest offshore drilling companies in the world, um, and and kind of worked through that. And I was kind of the guy you sent to go fix, fix something, you know, like the, the projects behind, or we have an underperforming asset. Can you go fix this? And eventually what happened in the mid, about the middle of the last decade is the uh, oil market, the bottom just dropped out, it went from $130 a barrel to like five or 20. And yeah. at that point, what the oil industry does is you, you don't need to fix anything anymore. So, so they just throw <laughs> it away because there's, you, you know, there's no, there's no money left. So um, that was, it kind of took that as a good time to bow out. I returned to the States um with uh went up to north carolina finished my uh mba with unc up there and then uh work, began working with honeywell in their um their smart grid solutions business so i ended up running their as the general manager for their energy efficiency and demand response business which was a global about a hundred million dollar a year business they had 15 of the top 25 utilities in the country where their customers um really got into like how the grid works today and what we're trying to do to make it more responsive, more reliable and more resilient. Uh, and I, I found that work very, very interesting. It was a little bit, uh, I had spent the entirety of my career at that point, kind of at the very pointy end of the spear as an expat. And it, the closer you get to, you know, the large HQs, um, you, you yep. just, it, it's, it's harder to make the impact you want to make at the speed yeah. you want to make it sometimes because you just need to get a lot of consensus and that's fine. Um, but at, from there, I kind of moved into the startup space and I was originally intending to kind of build, stand up a consulting firm, 
simply with the goal of helping miners understand demand response and their options better. Um, there was a, this was probably three, four years ago, there was a huge, massive gap in understanding. And I think the industry's come away, away since then, but I think there's still a lot there. Um, ended up getting picked up by one of the, one of the largest private miners in the country. And we kind of helped as their first energy hire. So I helped them build out all of their curtailment software, helped them recruit in an A plus team, worked on kind of hedging strategies and, and kind of unique ways to write their power agreements. They grew up fast. They went from 20 or 30 up to about 800 megawatts over 15 months. And uh, they're currently in a, a merger process. And, you know, I think that that, that brought up an op excellent opportunity for me to kind of hang a shingle out um, with Atacon Energy Solutions. And that's kind of where we are today. I'm a, kind of the, you know, what we're trying to do is be that connective tissue. We have great relationships with developers that want to build infrastructure, power companies that want to supply power, trading desks that can write deals, utilities. We do a lot of work with helping them with their economic development teams, as well as their uh, kind of tariff teams to help write language that's friendly for, um, you know, flexible data centers, but is also like really helpful for the utility and how they manage their grids. So uh, it's a, it's kind of a long breath. I'll pause there, but uh, that, that's kind of the oh, long it's... and the short of how we got here today. Well, and that's fantastic. That's exactly why I wanted to jump into that. Joe is, uh, that's so much background in that space. And it's the space I'm super interested in. Um, and like you said, and, and you kind of called attention to a lot of the reason I started the podcast in general is we're start we're just starting to see a transition of energy experts into the space, Bitcoin mining industry, that is. Um, and I'm really excited about it. I'm really excited for that, that type of professional, you know, group to step into the space. So you mentioned Honeywell, and I'm I'm really interested in Honeywell and what they call their their smart grid um and and that whole group when i so i you know i I did a little digging in before the show just to make sure i I kind of had my head wrapped around it. It looks more like like that program to me looks like they kind of touch on demand response, but that's from the like natural gas plant or like the you know the the plants that that spin up super quick to respond or smart meters in the homes you know trying to help coach consumers to use less which we can go into that that's interesting um is that am i spot on with that or is it, maybe touch on honeywell in that program yeah and i think it's important to understand too that honeywell is a monster uh great company they have they have a ton of different divisions that do it they have a very deep oil and gas division with a whole controls products on how to operate refineries and power plants more efficiently. Um, that's a great business. I, I wasn't um, as part of that business at the time. The group I was running was more focused on kind of what we see and I commercial and industrial or residential demand response. And you're right. What I would okay. call demand response 1.0 as it got rolled out across the country was exactly that. It was trying to get HVAC controls on, you know, the big box, the big box retail. It was trying to get people to have smart thermostats in their homes and, you know, take a bit of a discount to give up control of those during certain periods of time. And so there was a lot of behavioral management or risk management that you're going into. So no matter how many megawatts you have signed up, you never quite get the responsiveness that you're hoping for. Like someone's yeah. unplugged the thermostat or swapped it out or it's just refusing and turning their their AC back up. And if you think about it, really when the grid is the most stressed is usually when the weather is either hot or cold. And so there is a natural friction there to get, you know, the highest usage there is is typically environmental controls. It's it, There's a, a natural pu push and pull there uh, that's not present in Bitcoin mining. And I think that's kind of what led me to... Um, and, and I think the second, so let me finish that thought. I think the secondary part sure. of that is aggregating all of those assets and trying to manage them all from, um, it, it, it's, it's pretty heavy cat herding. Like it is, it is a naturally very decentralized source and group of assets and you have discontinuous data you're trying to like manage together. So it's a, it's a very difficult engineering challenge to really aggregate that load up to what would you would say is a grid scale. Um, kind of enterprise solution. 
I would imagine. Yeah. I, when, I mean, I, you know, I'm in Minnesota and I have XL energy and, and yep. XL, you know, they, they had a stint in Colorado that they were a little notorious for in as far as like smart meters and things like that. And, and they've tried rolling out similar programs in Minnesota. It just seems, and like you touched on, it just seems like a lot of cattle herding. And I mean, you know, how do you, how do you get the customer on a super hot day to turn the AC down? I mean, why would you do that? You know, it's, yeah, it's, it, I mean, utilities Interesting. naturally yeah. have a bit of a PR problem because when do you call your, you, when do you think about your utility when the power goes out? When there's problems, right? yeah. Right, when there's a problem. <laughs> Very rarely are you like, man, I love Duke Energy today. My lights are on just like they were yesterday. You know, like, that's just <laughs> not, and, and that's that's fine. It's not like, it's, it's a problem every utility struggles with, but I think it can make it more challenging. And I think that's where I, you know, kind of when I started and I fell down, the Bitcoin rabbit hole a little bit and I fell down kind of the mining a little bit and I looked at how these are truly geographically agnostic, large, scalable, flexible loads where every other one way I've been thinking about it the last week is every other load on a grid has its operating envelope. And then the grid kind of has to react to that, like when what when that thing is operating. And a mine is the exact opposite. It lets the grid right. define its operating envelope. And so that is so unique on the load side. I was like, well, we have to just build all these things. So this uh, is, yeah. I mean, the, you know, compounded by you had the, the analysis of the IRA came out a few months ago and they think we're going to need 500 gigawatts of flexible load in order to offset the uh, intermittent non-dispatchable renewals that were that were kind of incentivizing the build out for. When you consider that, you know, the US maybe has 10 to 30 gigs total right now. And, you know, the whole global Bitcoin network is maybe 15 gigs. Solar is, I think batteries are still sub 10. Like we need to build a lot of stuff. And I think the 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 cost density of batteries at for this application is very high. And I think you, yeah. you then kind of naturally have this large flexible compute load that can um, really kind of flip the script on it. Absolutely. And from your viewpoint, Bitcoin mining really steps into that scene then as a way to monetize that extra capacity that we have to build out to handle that renewable generation, right? Is that is that how you're thinking about this? Yeah, I think... Um, and so I'm, I have a bit of a different view on this than a lot of the traditional, some of the traditional Bitcoin miners do, um, or some of just the traditional Bitcoiners do, where I really view these facilities as you have four different products that you're selling. You have hash rate, you have ancillary services, which is kind of like, it, it goes by different names across the country, but it's essentially you're getting paid to turn on or off by some kind of program uh, at the state or local level. And then you have in deregulated markets, both physical power that you can purchase um, with like hedging instruments, et cetera, as well as financial products, like say options on your power, or um, you, know, you can liquidate your power back into the market very quickly if you need to. And so you're really trying to arbitrage all four of those products to maximize the total economic output of that facility. And I think that's what we spend a ton of time figuring out how we can help with. What I like about that, Joe, is hash rate is one of four bullets in, in what a Bitcoin mining center can provide. And I really think that that's going to help usher in the, the Bitcoin mining industry into this, this power and energy industry. Because, you know, if, if you just as an example, if you start speaking a power generator's language and you tell them, hey, this service is going to be the equivalent of a $200 a megawatt hour PPA fall out of their chair for that. I mean, that they, they would be so excited, but if you tell them, you know, how much hash rate you're going to have online and how much power draw you're going to have. And, you know, you kind of, you don't speak the language. So I'm, I'm excited for that because what you just laid out is mostly energy production focused. And I think that that's really going to help smooth things out. Yeah, Ben, I think that's um, certainly something that struck me. I mean, I've, I've talked to probably hundreds of utilities a year. I think a lot of people don't even realize maybe that there's over 2,000 individual utilities in the United States alone. It's a crazy number. Um, and they all have a very entrenched 
language vernacular and the way they view and let's be clear like these data centers are already very disruptive we've never had something this flexible on the demand side before and then when you flow, throw in an entire another world of vocabulary it gets tough <laughs> i've personally right. had a lot of success by just saying you know we're running accounting software and we get paid by the minute and so we every, every minute is over a short time frame every minute is equally economically valuable to the facility so whenever we make more money selling power back to the grid or an ancillary service than we do running accounting software then that's what we ought to kind of auto switch the the facility to do and miners can get their heads around that very quickly um and i think yes um that the power companies also begin to get it and they're like oh okay so i can actually like this is you view this as a profit center um, which historically it's just kind of been a ooh, we get a nice check for our dr program every year or it hasn't really been viewed as a profit center historically but i think that's part of the view we're trying to we're working to overturn as well absolutely um so i i actually kind of want to circle back to to honeywell sure one one last time Do it. have you so since Atacon and and your focus now have you gone back and explored conversations with Honeywell about maybe a Bitcoin mining as a service, um, just to use the, the SaaS, <laughs> everything is a service now, um, gone back and approached them as like a, hey, Bitcoin mining as a service, instead of trying to corral half your grid, you know, homeowners to turn their thermostat down, why don't you plug this in and you can control it? So... I can say I was talking to one of my former senior members of my team a few hours ago this morning. They've moved on to an another company, but in the same space. And uh, she's a superstar, but they've I've seen them the entire in the last 18 months, the perception of that entire industry of what this is is radically changing. Like they they're starting to get it because they realize, hey, it's flexible load and we need flexible load to make all of this stuff work. Like we may still want to do smart thermostats and you may still want to do, you know, smart yeah. home applications or EVs, but you need some base of flexible load that you can rely on to make all of the rest of that work. And they're starting to see that now. And I think it's important to remember a lot of times, like oh, these large utilities move relatively slow compared to how fast Bitcoin moves. Um, you know, like the, a lot of these programs where they design this stuff are on like a three to five year cycle time where they like review the regulations and stuff every three years. So you have a 36 month turnover on the contracting. And so yeah. even if you t decide today, everybody that this is the way, it's going to be a full 36 months <laughs> before you get, you know, some of your earliest adopters right. that are deploying this stuff. And so that, that's where I'm, you know, that's why you got to have that education now and get it today. And, but when it starts hitting, it's going to be a massive snowball that people are going to be amazed at because all of a sudden it's going to be every Home Depot and Lowe's is going to have a hash rate enabled space tier and every, you know, every utility is going to offer subsidies for commercial, like the best example I like to use are like recycling. Recycling facilities are complicated, right? Because they're great. Mm -hmm. Everyone thinks we need them. Their power usage is like, if it, say it's one for 29 and a half days of the month. And then that other half a day, they're at a hundred. They have like, when they run their compactors, it's very spiky. And now you have that, you have to pay for the grid to have that peak available all month yeah. long. And you just have all this dead weight loss. And then and yep. when you look like, oh, well, we like energy efficiency of recycling and we need demand response and we can combine it all of a sudden it's like, oh, wow. Like that's a whole, that's a whole market segment that you can go deploy this stuff into. And so you'll start to see those coming and hopefully as we get more and more of, of the energy of the, you know, energy professionals over onto the orange side of the, of the, of the, of the load, we'll, uh, we'll see that happen faster and faster, but it, it I, I think it's fascinating to see, and it, I'm excited by what's happening. I'm, I'm excited by it. I'm, so I'm coming from, you know, gigantic corporate world too. I'm coming from 3M in yep. my, my past, you know, look, I get it. I understand, you know, this is like moving the Titanic. It's going to take, like you said, 36 months just to 
to get it to move in the direction. And then when it moves, it, it picks up traction, but um, oh, it's fascinating. I'm so excited about it. I, I really think we're going to see some of the coolest stuff come out for the grid. And it's cool for people like you and I who nerd out over this stuff. I don't think, you know, my friends who don't understand what happens when they flip a light switch, I don't think they're going to think it's cool, but man, I'm so excited for it. <laughs> um, yeah, I wish. I mean, I think that education piece is a big part of it. And I think there's a little bit of sympathy there on both sides because the power industry has been sitting there forever. Like no one understands what we do. Like no one knows how big of an operation this is and how critical it is to everything. And, you know, it's kind of like, well, a lot of people don't understand how like all like all the flexibility that the that this asset's going to bring to the grid and the Bitcoiners are jumping up and down being like, this is great. And it's so, but like, yeah, they, yeah. they, they come over, they, there's a meeting of the minds that's starting to happen. And, I, and it's been super exciting to see when I go to industry, power industry conferences, all of the feedback I get is just curiosity and questions. And, and they, and they just want to know, and they want to have a lot of energy professionals pick it up very quickly. If it can be explained in their terms, like you say, yeah. you know, hash rate, exahash, you know, ASICs and they're, and they're like, I don't understand. I don't know what these, what these are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but if you meet them, meet them in the middle or meet them on their side of the aisle a little bit, you can bring them over pretty quickly. I find. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so a little bit of a transition, Joe, I, I, you had mentioned that, that you had an opportunity to go work for one of the, the largest, if not the largest private Bitcoin mining, uh, companies in the U S and, I'd really like to hear what went into building out their energy platform or their energy strategy. I it why I'm curious about that is because I don't think very many people get a look behind the curtain into how to build out an energy strategy for a Bitcoin mining company at scale like that. So I'd love for you to maybe just expand on what that experience is like and, and how that went. Yeah, um happy to. Uh Two word answer. Very Where to start, word. right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think what is important to remember is you kind of need some foundational muscles in the business in order to really make this successful. And I think that comes down to historically, a lot of these facilities have spent a lot of time thinking about how they manage their pools, um, how you're managing all of your networking, you know, all of a lot of like IT and, you know, and even spent a lot of time on design on like how airflow is being managed, et cetera. Um, but I think in order to be kind of a get up into that best in class level, you also need to have a very sophisticated control of the machines from a power consumption side. And that's not always easy to do. A lot of the miners have very opaque firmware, or if you, use if you want to put in some of the third party firmware you can void warranties which isn't as big a deal if you're small but if you are at an institutional scale and dealing with institutional credit parties that can be a problem and yeah. and so how do you figure out how to make the site as responsive as possible one how do you how do you get a software suite in place where you can turn on and off and how do you once you have that you need to set guardrails in on your kind of your wear and tear right what's going to happen if i turn it on and off yeah, I can turn off in 30 seconds and I can turn back on in a minute. But if I do that eight times in a row, how many how many miners am I going to break? How many how many servers am I yep. going to blow up? So there's a little bit. So there's like controls. How are we going to put controls in on, you know, kind of your I would call it PM or maintenance controls on top of it. After that, it's like, OK, now how are we going to get this system? The grid moves. And this is I would say the complexity scales with the more deregulated of a market you get into. And by that, I mean, at that point, if you're in, say, the southeast U.S., where you have a rate where you know you're turning on and off at the same time every day, you can probably program those times in and you're good to go. But in the Midwest, the Plain States, Texas, where you have independent power grids with real-time pricing, you now, you now have another input into your system where you want to be changing your behavior based on what that power price is telling you. And so then you're going to be okay. building out to that. And then that kind of naturally leads to the extent of, well, how can I control my exposure to that power price? And I, okay, well, I may need, I may need some hedges. I may want to buy a, 
a PPA with a renewable source, or I may want to, um, you know, maybe I'm going to have demand response bidding in. Um, and then maybe if I want to turn off, I need to make sure I'm turning my bidding for my demand response off because I've already committed that load and I need to turn off to liquidate my power against my hedge. So you have all of a sudden several different counterparties at play that you're trying to interact with programmatically. And then you're backing that out and back to backing that with legal agreements with your power providers, um, with your utilities um, that own the wires and lines, with the demand response company. So it's a, I would recommend going inside out a little bit. It's very difficult to start at the top of that if you don't have you're never the, the more sophisticated you can be at fine grained control of the data center, the better and more success you will have negotiating top tier agreements with partners. Interesting. Okay. Um, and so that, and so that's now you're okay. So now you got to go find another site. And so then that brings in a whole other, you know, how do you, what kind of data do you want to use? There is a lot of providers that, um, there are some great ones on the market that are used by the traditional power industry where you can see where a lot of depressed pricing may exist. But in order to access that depressed pricing, you may need to get a custom arrangement with the local utility that controls that service territory. So you kind of you see this kind of like daisy chains along where there is there is a lot of um, the system wasn't designed to heavily facilitate large flexible loads, but it also wasn't really designed for outlawing them or preventing them. It was just almost never contemplated. So it's a lot of blue sure. water out there um, where you're trying to help all these existing actors in the space help you. And I think that's kind of the core of what we spent all of our time, a lot of our time doing was kind of really driving that to ground on each one. Like what is a, what does success look like for both sides on on this negotiation or on this partnership or in this location. And then once you're deployed, how do you have that operational excellence and make sure you're successful? Uh, that's, I really appreciate the walk through that. Um, and I know that that, you know, is probably 10,000 foot view and, and that there's a lot of minutia and, and nuance to all of that. I'd actually, I'm, I'm fascinated by hedging and, and just the whole like, hedging your exposure to the power pricing when you were scaling that up i mean were you doing that is that you that was making sure that you were selling back when you needed to or did, were you guys working with brokers did you have broker relationships in there and they were doing that for you so my preference has always been to partner directly with the power trading desks the guys that have a finger on the trigger and are spending all day in a risk chair managing um, their exposure, right? Um, as you know, the base economics, and I'm not—I know your industry, your, your audience probably has a pretty good handle on this. But essentially, if you're buying power at say four cents for the rest of the year, I'm going to buy twenty-four by seven power for the rest of the year at four cents. Okay. Every fifteen-minute interval in Texas or five-minute interval, you have the choice. You can either consume that power, or you can sell it back at whatever the market price is. Now, where that becomes very relevant for flexible loads is you do have that choice. A lot of traditional loads don't. You're just going, the grocery store is not going to turn off because power prices spike, right? Um, right, right. But in the morning, you know, say during one of your ramp periods where the sun isn't showing up, it's cloudy, the wind has died down for the night, you see power prices spike up to two or three or $400 from $40 or four cents. Well, you can turn off for an hour and essentially pay for four hours of power that day, because when you sell it into the market, you're getting paid that market price. And so okay. I prefer to take an approach of a strategic relationship with a strong trader where you set an operating envelope that supports your trading strategy, where you already know when you're going to be turning off and at what pricing and during what times of day. And it's all programmed in. And so, and so that makes it easier for one, um, the, the trading group to make sure it's successful and you're maximizing your results. And two, for your operations teams on the ground. Nothing gets more frantic than if you have someone from, you know, 700 miles away calling you being like, 
fire the lasers, turn it off, turn it on, turn it off, like all day. Like it is, it is yeah. not an environment that is conducive to success. No. So I, I think to answer your question, I think it's a combination of automation as well as having very strong counterparties that are very good at managing risk and and are and have been doing it for a long time. Okay. And I, I appreciate that. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, please. I, I was going to say, I appreciate the, the explanation there because it, it really is kind of a, you know, I, I, again, I go back to my friends that don't know what happens when you, when you turn the light switch on and the lights come on, but then you try to explain hedging and, you know, like you just said, you, you, you buy your power for a whole year at four cents and, and the, the market spikes to $200 per megawatt hour. So I appreciate that, that example and that walkthrough. When you were working with this mining company and building all this out, what what was maybe the the biggest like friction point at the mining company when explaining this energy strategy for them, or did they just understand it and say, "Hey, Joe, you you got this. You know what you're doing." Um, I think it was a very active conversation. There was a lot of very very smart people there um and and they were very good at learning um and i think that it's also energy is a very very big topic and it's kind of an industry that has its own like ebbs and flows and almost its own cadence yeah. to it right and so i think there's a there's a little bit of both there i think probably a good example of one of the bigger challenges you have is just the by definition, new industries to utilities are viewed as risky, especially looking at the history of the mining industry where, you know, the last cycle, 2017, 2018, you had people driving around in semis, moving megawatts of load around, just like essentially hot shotting um, to, to different warehouses. Yeah. So that that really, I don't think, set a great tone that we've been working on, you know, the industry's been working on recovering from since then. And as a result, you often have some pretty you can have some pretty high collateral requests from the power companies where they want you to put a you know if you're going to buy power for a year you know they typically want you to prepay a couple months of that as collateral against that hedge right because as power trades the value of that hedge you know that you bought also changes and so you know they're kind of yeah. like banks they don't want, they don't lose money so so they they want to make sure that your position is positive all the time well for mining companies as a whole, as an industry, capital is very expensive, right? We're, yep. It's VC dollars, and it's and it's typically uh, either either VC dollars or expensive debt. And the last thing you typically want to do is have your dollars sitting idle in a escrow account because you have to hold collateral somewhere. I think yep. we've made. And we've continued this work at Atticon, a ton of advances on novel ways to reduce that down to almost low to no collateral for miners. And so I think that's going to be a big uh, thing. We're going to a big piece we're going to be rolling out this year and kind of a, a new kind of way of thinking about the product is, look, here's some ways you can get into a mining operation with very low collateral up front instead of having to budget in not just two months of electricity bills, but two month of electricity bills plus three, four, five, seven million dollars of just collateral, right? Yeah. And so yeah. uh, that's something we spend a lot about and has continued to evolve. And I've continued to see both sides of that aisle move. And there's some great startups in the space that are working to help solve that, as well as just some create creative uh, design around how you're thinking about that asset and, and what you can do to make all the risk teams feel much more comfortable. The the collateralizing has it, it is a challenge. Um, so it's it's interesting to hear that that was, you know, similarly a, a large challenge for for you guys there as well. I'm I'm excited to see not only what you guys are going to do in that space, but then how that space continues to evolve. It's I kind of hear both both sides of it. Is some people tell me that that's it's just industry standard. I mean, if a widget factory wants to go in, they're going to need to you know, have the same collateral requirements. Um, but then I also hear that it's a little more aggressive for Bitcoin mining because it's nascent and, you know, people are still trying to figure this thing out. And yeah, there were some cowboy days there where you had, <laughs> you had uh, shipping containers with one to two megawatts of load just cruising around the U.S. <laughs> so, uh, That's right. Cool. 
And I think maybe a, to push back on that a little bit, I think the position that I usually take is that we're actually less risky from a than a manufacturing, right? Where like manufacturers have to post a hedge because you know they're going to have to run. Whereas if you were able to get to an agreement with your power partners where it's like, look, I will turn off whenever the power goes above this or you can turn me off, which is something that's never been really an option. Nobody gives the power company the ability to turn them off. But no, I, I can tell you 3M is not uh, offering to let their manufacturing can. plants get turned off. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, that's so, great pushback. I, I, I like that. And when and all of a sudden, if you can get people to think a little creatively about it, it's like, oh, wow. Yeah, actually, like, I'm not going to have I, I have a cap on my high price exposure. I should be able to reduce the collateral requirements accordingly for that, you know, and so that's kind of the first step. And then you kind of lead three or four or five ways down there. And there's a lot of things you can do. Um, but I think you could get to a point where um, very quickly you'll be, you'll see some miners be able to get to a position where they're actually in negative collateral or where they're actually getting um, potentially either paid to bring their load there or very quickly are able to get all of their collateral returned after commencing operations. Um, I think there's, I'm excited for those days. It's, it's, it's still early. I think I give us another 18 to 24 months, but I think, I think you're going to see an inevitable shift that way. As you see the, as you see the power industry continue to get more comfortable with how to manage these things. Yeah. It, it's going to be exciting to see that all unfold. So we've brought up Atticon a couple of times and we, we haven't quite done a, a dive into your company. So please, Joe, walk us through Atacon Energy Solutions. What do you guys do? How are you doing it? Who are your customers? All that. Yeah. So I think something, so anytime you embark on an adventure like this, kind of inventing a new business model in a very young industry, you know, you kind of want to think a little bit at least about what, what problem are you trying to solve? And I think something I saw through the last two or so years of just going working in the industry is there is a big, there is almost like a need of a traffic director a little bit where there is like a, a, a kind of a party that's able to help people get the resources they need. And I think that's everybody in the space is like, if it's an eight piece puzzle, a lot of people are walking around with five or six pieces and just stuck. And they all have maybe different pieces of them, whether it's the power, the site, figuring out their demand response, acquisition of their ASICs, figuring out how they're going to install op O and M, you know, like EPCs. It's a, it's a yeah. very multidisciplinary yeah. thing to try and build on a, on a, you know, in an industry that's not super well capitalized yet. And so I was like, well, I think there's two things we can do to solve this problem. One is there's what I call the amortization wall or, or hill where you have, you know, miners are traditionally looking at pay, getting their ASICs to pay back within two to four years. A data center build, um, you're going to typically be able to depreciate that between like 15 or 20 years if you're doing like a cathedral style building or, you know, something in that form factor. And then the power plants themselves are 50 year assets, right? And so when you're, when you see the miners have been trying to integrate because obviously that's, I mean, that's what everybody learns is, you know, the more integrated you are, the more you can, more value you can capture. And while true, um, it is also incredibly capital intensive. And even just yeah. owning an ASIC fleet is a very capital intensive business. And so when you start tying up money that you're going to need for ASICs into infrastructure that you have a 15 year, you know, kind of payback rate on, it gets very difficult. And so we feel that we can help bridge that gap by bringing power to the table, bringing infrastructure developers to the table and kind of getting sites and development opportunities to the point where the miners can come in and do what they do best, right? Put racking in, get up and running, put your, you know, proprietary management software, networking, all your special sauce and operate that site very successfully without necessarily having to put a lot of that other infrastructure on your balance sheet, unless that's really a willful choice of yours, right? Unless that is intentionally part of your strategy. Um, 
the counter the you know kind of the other side we work with is i've you know i've talked i work with a lot of large miners to help them think about their strategy on how to approach the market because i think you see you know larger miners are beginning to kind of niche out into where they feel that they're strongest some of them are kind of focusing on you know we do wind assets or we do um you know we really like being this size you know like there's a couple of yep. miners where they're just like we just we we love the 10 to 40 megawatt sizing we feel we can get better pricing it's a little bit of an extra opex burden but it gives us a lot of you know grid diversity and so that, that you just see these different strategies coming out and and so i work with some of them to help them um you know either refine those or deploy them into the field um i've also you know we've been engaged by several large power generators to help them think about hey how do we put hundreds of megawatts behind the meter at our power plants in a very thoughtful way and like how do we create that kind of environment where you know we're it's it's credit worthy counterparties and you're able to like create a product that's best in class um and yeah so between that so we have i would say four or five large behind the meter projects we work on with with kind of large traditional power counterparties and then we usually have a stack of 10 to 15 sites in that smaller range that we're developing and, and kind of bringing into market i think something that we've noticed is in the in the peak last year you saw a lot of the you saw a lot of I would say low or non value add parties kind of trying to come into the space where it would be like, yeah. Oh, you want to buy ASICs? Well, you got to buy through Tom, we introduce you to Steve, we introduce you to Bill and Rick and, and Dan. And, and, <laughs> all on and then Telegram. All of a sudden, you've got, you know, you've got 30 or 40% <laughs> referral fees on just trying to meet somebody. And it's just not, um, that's not the sign of a mature industry where you have pretty transparent pricing and you know very transparent economics so people can evaluate opportunities right so that's what we do is like when we put new sites in the market we're like look this is your pass through rate from the utility this is exactly what either your sale price or your lease is going to cost this is your out of pocket to get in there this is exactly what your utility operating envelope should be expected to be just very very like answer all those questions because it's very difficult for miners to afford to put a an entire energy team in place or even even have one or two people that can cover the entire breadth and so we aim to be kind of that service for them to be like hey look we're either we'll we can either come in and help you individually or just the products we're bringing to market we've wrapped that all up like you this is all it's in a bow it's good for you and if you have any problems you i come in and i come help you work them out with the utility or you yeah. know kind of whoever you have down the road so that's kind of the i know that's a little bit wide ranging but i think at its core we're really trying to be that connective tissue that can help us build, you know, a sustainable pipeline of growth across the industry um, in the mining space. I really appreciate that. That was awesome walkthrough of just, you know, the the value that you bring to to both sides of this this equation, which is phenomenal that you you're bridging that gap and and I'm really excited about all of it. Um I, I did just want to ask, you mentioned, I think it was at the top of the show, you know, that, that you do some utility consultation on like tariff rates and stuff like that. Are, are you seeing more interest from the utilities on, like you said, kind of that big scaled out behind the meter operation, or are they more, you know, Hey Joe, come help us on a tariff structure to attract these customers. This is a good question. Um, I think. You're, so there's there's almost like three different sides to this. It's like a triangle where you've got yeah. the owners of the generation where they're like, oh, we can really leverage the flexibility of this behind the fence. And then you've got the power trader types or the, the types in the market that are like, oh, we can really monetize this asset as a as a highly flexible load. And then I think you see in some of the regulated areas, the economic development teams that, and these guys are all very, very good. They work very, very hard and they have a t pretty tough job because their job is to go out and source large loads for their communities and utilities. 
And those can yeah. be very long lead time deals to try and pull together. You're talking like Intel plants, Ford plants, you know, like big consumers. Yeah. What they've seen the last couple of years is while uh, these data centers punch way above their weight on power consumption, which is what they want, they also have a very interesting jobs component where it's not nearly as jobs dense as a auto parts plant. But it's non-zero or close to zero, which is what you often get from like batteries or solar, where it just kind of, once you put it out there, there isn't really a lot of extra jobs in the community servicing that asset. Um, these are kind of durable nine to five, what you would call like gray collar type jobs that come in where, you know, the, the compensation is really good. And you can look at now with the geographic flexibility of these, you can look at placing them in economically distressed areas or areas where, hey, we lost the the, the mill. Um, the town's only got 1,500 people. You can't put an auto parts plant there. You literally don't have enough people. You can certainly right. go put in a Bitcoin data center there and 20 or 30 jobs in a town of 1,500 makes a huge difference. It's huge. And so yeah. um, like you're single-handedly chopping at unemployment by 2% when you walk in the door. You know, like, I mean, that's a big deal. Um, and so yep. th they're that theme i think is very interesting right now in the economic development scene for the for the traditional ious the big you know battleship utilities um and i think to add one more thing there i'm seeing a lot of interest on you know as we know this is a great customer of first and last resort you can kind of be that trailblazer species species where in this instance, you can anchor a um, a new industrial park, right? And you can, yes, you'd love a great rate for that and you're gonna come in, but whenever you sell through the rest of the industrial park, you can obviously size the data center down appropriately. And so it's a super elegant solution for, <coughs> excuse me, super elegant solution for utilities to actually get some of this economic development work done that they're trying to. So yeah, I'm, planning on having a lot more there in Q2 this year. I've got several conferences that I'm very, very excited to attend. Um, and I think we'll see more movement on that as we move through this year. I think early this year was heavier on power trading, asset optimization, you know, site development. I think th those will continue to be strong themes, but we're looking to really yeah. add that in as a actionable you know, actionable item for our partners in the next 90 days. Uh, that's a, that's fantastic to hear. I, and it, I mean, again, it just, it just adds to all the excitement about this space and, and how these two industries are starting to collide. Um, and, and so, you know, I typically have these conversations with my guests and I'm having them off the show on the show. And I, I always kind of catch myself going, you know, holy shit, this is all so exciting and cool, really but there has to be like the flip side. And I'm always curious to hear, you know, are you hearing pushback? Like, are are there companies or, or people that, you know, you may be approaching and they say, you know, Joe, that's just not for us. I mean, are you, are you getting any of that? Every day. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I think, I think that the counterpoint of the opportunity of a lot of these small towns is also can be their blind spot. Um, we, here's a great example. I'm not going to, I don't want to dox anybody or anything, but small, no. yeah. small utility in middle America. We called them up. We found a site there that had, I think 10 megawatts of available power, beautiful building by the rail yard. So like no noise isn't going to be an issue. And we're like, hey, what are your power rates? And they sent us over the rates and the town's so small, they only have residential and commercial rates. And so their power rates are like 12 cents, you know, like something yeah. very, very expensive. And so we called them and we tried to get to the city manager and we're like, hey, look, we, we'd love to have a conversation about this because we'd love to build this site out and bring some jobs here. And I don't think you understand if we paid that rate with that much power, your city budget would probably quadruple. And we don't know that that's exactly the right balance of incentives that we want to that, like make a ton of <laughs> right. sense. I mean, we can, we're perfectly happy to and want to support the community and, and, and be that boon to the city budget. But, and it, I don't think there's any malice there a lot, Ben. I think it's a lot of like, they've just never had that opportunity or to think about it. And so it's, 
it's different. They don't feel qualified to speak on it. They don't, you know, these small towns typically have very small staffs. They don't think yeah. about how they're, you know, even if they are the electric company, they don't think about it as like a strategic asset for them on like how they can use that to help the town. Um, and, and so that just goes back to education. But I think that happens a lot. I think there's um, I, a lot of the pushback on this isn't real is, has kind of gone away as the people that, you know, the industry as a whole has been getting a lot more attention over the last two years. And as they've been staring at it, they're like, well, I, uh, well, it looks like it's coming back. I guess, I guess it's still here. This. It's not <laughs> dead yet. <laughs> and I right? think, you know, historically, their, their biggest input costs are, are hydrocarbons, right? Are, are natural gas. And, and those markets are typically very cyclical. So there's a natural understanding of cyclical markets and you're seeing them that's starting to be incorporated into their heuristics. So I found it interesting where I've been getting pushed back in the reverse a little bit is all of a sudden into this year, I've seen a ton of interest to deploy capital from large power groups and large developers and the miners just not having any, any powder left. And so now you're at a point oh, where wow. like there is starting to be a segment of the industry that's like, let's build more Bitcoin infrastructure. And the miners are like, I don't have enough money. <laughs> and that is... <laughs> 180 <laughs> degrees. So now it's like, yeah, what, that's, that's what do a you flip. Want, guys? <laughs> yeah, right. But, you know, I well, think and that, I think you're, go ahead. I was going to say, I think, I think we're kind of seeing it. And I mean, there, there's a lot that goes into like the hash rate, the network hash rate. So, what, you know, to get kind of into the, the, the jargon on the Bitcoin mining side of this equation, it's, I mean, we're seeing the, the network hash rate rip. I mean, and that, that's, you know, when you look at the economics of Bitcoin mining, it makes it challenging, but it, it kind of speaks to. And so I know a lot of it is, you know, these these big pub co's and the big private companies are, you know, redeploying older generation hardware as the price climbs back up. But, you know, it also makes me think that like what you're saying, there is now this demand to bring this online and to bring more of this and. Yeah, you're just seeing this unrelenting climb up and to the right for the network hash rate. It's crazy. It's been nuts. And I, I'll tell you what, like, I almost, I don't know what to think about the having at this point, Ben, honestly, because if you look at it either. in the last <laughs> 10 or 12 weeks, we've had half a having. I mean, the, the, the it's gotten, we've added like 30 or 40% difficulty to the network in the last couple of months. Um, yeah. And, I think you're going to see that trend continue. And I think it's going to be because back to our earlier comments about how you have four products to sell, you all of a sudden now it's not a binary option. And I, you saw, you, you saw a big rise kind of almost when hash price was getting very low there, it was staying pretty resilient. I think that was a lot of flushing out of second and even third gen hardware and finally replacing it with late gen stuff. And now yeah. you're seeing some of that second gen hardware come back into the market um, because it's uh, you're, you're starting to find attractive power. I think that the, you know, just as much as $11 natural gas was a major headwind that really broke the back of some miners last year, sub $2 natural gas is a massive tailwind right now. You've seen mm -hmm. an easing on economics and also a realization that, hey, you don't have to make 80% gross margins. If you're making 20 or 30% gross margins and continuing to build a strong business, you're doing great. Um, so That's right. I, I, I do not want to predict where it is going or how fast it's going to grow, but I don't see... Um, in no conversations with large parties talking about putting down miners, do I, ha do I hear them concerned about there being too much hash rate? So I guess I could put it, leave it there. Yeah. And when you kind of, you know, keep looking at the incentive structure with Bitcoin mining and, and for a lot of the, the points in the conversation we just had there around the hash rate, you know, it, it really, the economic incentives really drive Bitcoin mining behind the meter and vertically integrated at these power companies. And so it's, it, it's really exciting to hear that that's already starting to kind of shape up and, um, yeah, well, I really appreciate that. I, so, you know, Joe, as we kind of wind down the conversation here, I, I always like to, you know, when I'm talking with 
Bitcoin mining companies, I always like to say, you know, from your perspective, what are you missing or, or what are utility companies maybe missing if they're saying no? And on the flip, I like to ask the power companies, you know, what, what Bitcoin miners might be missing when they approach a power company. You kind of live in both, both worlds. Um, you know, would you care to, to take a whack at, at both sides? You know, what are, what might, you know, broad stroke Bitcoin miners be missing when they address not address when Bitcoin miners approach a power company and then the, the flip side of that. So I think, let me do a quick high level one and then I can maybe yeah. go like on approach there. I think that the, I think something that a lot of the mining community is missing is they kind of assume that the natural hash rate price will go to zero and not to the marginal cost of electricity in the largest power market, right? And okay. so we do see some pushing behind the meter, but I think you're going to continue to see when other incentives become involved that require you to be in front of the meter, like engaging in power markets, getting economic development credits. You know, if you think about, oh, if you go into one of these small towns and you can basically never raise taxes in the town again by just expanding the size of the Bitcoin mine, that becomes like a, a system critical industry for the town. Like they're going to make that work. Right. And so like when you yeah. th think about all these other applications, I think the, the mining community kind of loves to, loves to perform analysis and distill things down. Oh, this is the Nakamoto <laughs> point. Once we hit this, you know, ah, uh, it's all over. Nobody makes any money again. And I think it's a more nuanced story there. So I would challenge the, mi the mining community as a whole to be more nuanced in analyzing opportunities. Um, on the power side and the and the utilities, I think I would challenge them to think more aggressively about what they want instead of like what the customer, um, you know, will allow them to take. Because in a lot of the relationships I have or conversations about like, how do we structure a custom product? They're like, well, what if we only cut you off like 3% of the hours a year you know, and we could cut the price a little bit. And I, and I say back, like, what if I let you cut me 12% of the hours in a year? What's my price then? Mm. And, it, and, and they, I don't think that they've thought from that other side as creatively yet on really like, how do you leverage every, all of the tools you have as a utility to really like bring this flexible load in. And I also don't think they've really thought about how, say you're a large utility, you have a hundred megawatts of oil fired, power and you just get beat up every year by the public utility commission because you've got oil filed oil oil fired power still on your grid yeah. and it, you literally can drop that to zero by putting in a data center you control using that same infrastructure and retiring that plant and and running it exactly inverse of how you would run the oil the oil peaker plant and now you've reduced your emissions dramatically and you're able to get cost recovery on all the capex for that new infrastructure you put. So I think there is a yeah. in that respect, I think the power companies, the more they get comfortable with like owning the concrete pads or the buildings or the substations isn't and should not be scary for them. And I think the more they see that that is a big opportunity for them, um, the more you'll see that collaboration increase. That's great. I so again, you kind of float right in the middle of those two worlds. So um, the perspective there is phenomenal. I mean, for me, it's, I'm learning a ton in this conversation. So I, I really appreciate that. Um, so Joe, at the end, I, I always like to give room for my guests to let my audience know how they can get in touch with you. Um, you, you are offering a phenomenal service. So I want, you know, my audience to be able to get in touch with you. Um, so please share contact and, and how people can get in touch with you. Sure. Um, I'm on. Uh, so the name of the company is Adacon Energy, A-D-A-K-O-N. Um, emails Joe at Adacon Energy. So very simple there. And on most socials, including Twitter, Telegram, you know, all the others, my, my handles typically that Joe, you know. Um, so pretty easy to pretty easy to track I down. Like it. <laughs> um, thank you. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm relatively active on I'm very responsive on messaging and, and relatively active on socials. Also, we've got a, a, what we think is a great business we're building. So we're pretty busy too, but, uh, you know, always try and get back to people when they reach out and always interested in, in trying to help people out, whether big or small. So we, we, we want to, you know, be a, 
this is going to take a village and, and, and we need more members. So let's keep building. <laughs> awesome. And, I, and, and well, Ben, I want to thank you for having us, having me on. This has been an absolute blast. I think um, some great questions and insights that I help me think more deeply about things and be better at what I do. So I thank you for the, thank you for the great questioning. And it's always a, you know, always a pleasure. I've loved, I've loved uh, getting, getting the invite and, and working with you on this. I'm flattered. Thanks. I, it, it's been a blast having you on. Um, the conversation was phenomenal and I, I know the audience got just as much out of this as I did. So Joe, really appreciate your time. You take care. Thanks, Ben.